This program is presented and distributed by Keep the Faith on the web at www.keepthefaith.org. Just before I give you this little talk, I just want to point out, Bill's always always calling me English. I want to point out, I'll explain to you the difference between being English and being Welsh, which is really relevant to everything we've been talking about. So the Britain, which was conquered by the Romans and ruled by the Romans for 400 years, was a Celtic country. The Celts, you know, they lived in Ireland. Uh, what's now Scotland, and in Brittany, and in parts of Spain, in Galicia, I think. Uh, that, that was a Celtic part. And the, yes, and the Romans came in, uh, they conquered Britain, they ruled Britain for 400 years, and the, the, the British became Christians. Uh, then in the, when the Romans, around the year 400, the legions started leaving the outposts of the empire to go back and defend Rome against the barbarians. Then Britain had no, they had no army to defend it, and tribes of Germans started coming to Britain and conquering it bit by bit. The last great British king was uh, Arthur. Uh, he didn't go around wearing you know, suits of armour and uh, you know, on great charges and things. He was, uh, he was a Briton. Now, any armour they had would have been you know, armour left over from the Romans. And while he was there, he kept the uh, German tribes out of the west of England. But after his death, they gradually drove the Britons out from Britain into, into what is now Wales, up into the hills, down to the very southwest of uh, Britain, which is Cornwall. Has anyone here ever been to Cornwall? Yeah, it's a lovely place. If you go, if you visit Britain, don't just go to London, for goodness sake. Go and see all these lovely places. And right up to the very, very north of England, where they got sam- sandwiched between uh, the, these Germans and, and the Scots. And uh, a lot of the names that are... And, it was then called England, which is Angoland, because the tribes who came were the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jutes. And you, a lot of the names in England, if you've heard of some of the counties, Essex, that means the East Saxons. Wessex is the West Saxons. Sussex is the South Saxons. Then you get East Anglia, which were, it was, it was the East Angles. Uh, Kent, where I live now, that was settled by the Jutes. Then, as you know, uh, St. Gregory the Great, he's supposed to have seen some... Uh, Saxon slaves who'd been captured in a market in Rome and uh, he decided to send St. Augustine uh, St. Augustine of Canterbury of course not St. Augustine of Hippo he eventually sent him to convert the English now there was already the Welsh church well the British church because the, the Britons and the Welsh are the same people we're like the say the Apaches in America we were there before the, that was settled and uh, we would have the Britons living in Wales, they'd have nothing to do with the Saxons. And then you had the two churches for a time being you know, that, that would have nothing at all to do with them. And Pelagius, who's been mentioned, he actually was, uh, he was a Briton. He, you know, the same race as me, he was actually Welsh. We got the distinction of having one of the very earliest heretics. <laughs> Perhaps, you know, about a thousand years before America was discovered, you've got a lot of heretics now, but... <laughs> we, so that puts you in perspective. We had a heretic a thousand years uh, before that. And uh, so, I said that, so there is a, there is a very great difference between, uh, you know, between being uh, Welsh and being English. And we're all British. You see, we, we have a British passport. So Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales and England, we all have the same passport. Uh, and we're all citizens of Great Britain. But you have the different, you, you have the different nationalities. Uh, so I thought I'd point that out. Now, uh, I wouldn't waste time taking... T- I mean, if you want to take some notes, you can. I'm having a little booklet down on the subject of the talk that I'm going to give. And anybody who's here today, if you've given me your name and address, I'll send you a copy, uh, a free copy of it. It should come out probably sometime October or November. Uh, but there, there is just something I'd like you to write down especially anyone who isn't familiar with it the two words I'm going to use they're the famous words you know, the, I should be talking about the Council of Nicaea 
this famous word humusion. Uh, it's, uh, correct me if I get it wrong, it's H O M double O U S I O N. That, that's, that means consubstantial. And then there was the new formula, it was devised by a basil of Ankara. And as John will tell you, it's so confusing at this time, there's so many people with the same name, aren't there? There's, uh, um, most of the Arians, when the Arian heresy is referred to, they're usually referred to as the Eusebians. Because the greatest promoter of the Arian heresy was a man called Eusebius of Nicomedia. Uh, but there are about five or six Eusebius or Eusebii <laughs> floating about at this time. And then there are Basils, I, I noticed John called him Basil, we say Basil. Uh, in England, and there was a ba- there's the great basil, then there's another basil of Ankara, and he, he coined this new formula, homoision, and you spell that H O M O, and then you put an I in it, this famous Greek letter iota, then it's O U S I O N, homoision. Now, homoision means of like substance with the Father, I should be referring to these two terms later on, but. Uh, this is frequently referred to, this I, the, the, you know that's the Greek word for I is iota. And that made the whole difference between being a Christian and not being a Christian. Because what really makes you a Christian is that you believe Christ is divine. You believe, he's, that you believe in the Blessed Trinity and you believe Christ is equal to God the Father. If you want to really know how to annoy Jehovah's Witnesses when they come around, tell them they're not Christians. Which they aren't Christians because they don't believe in the divinity. They say, oh, we follow Christ. But the Arians, as you see, they, they, they came to follow Christ. In fact, sometimes the Arians were more devout than the Catholics. I know there's a very good story in one of Cardinal Newman's books about how the Catholics, they're having, they're all, they used to have physical battles with the Arians. And they decided the best time to get the Arians was on Sunday because they'd be celebrating Mass. <laughs> And they could swoop down and wipe them out <laughs> while they're all uh, having mass, which is what they did. Uh, and I should be talking to you, too, uh, about St. Athanasius. And, uh, and in the old Catholic Encyclopedia, it mentions that the life of St. Athanasius, it was a bewildering maze of events. So I'm going to try and keep it as simple as possible. In the booklet I'm writing, I'm going to make a time chart giving all the principal events and dates. But even then, the, pr- the principal events and dates in the life of St. Athanasius, you, you, have, you, you have to cut them down to about half. It, it, it is so very, very complicated. Now, a very, very great uh, English historian, Philip Hughes, I noticed that uh, John has got one of his books here on the history of the church. His greatest book was the history of the English Reformation. But he, he noted in his history of the church, he said, in the life of the church, it's a, you see a pattern of events that started right from the very, very beginning and it just keeps repeating itself over and over again, which is absolutely true. And you'll notice in what I'm going to say to you today that uh, some aspects of a pattern of events that, that are applicable to our own time. Uh, now, I'd like... I'll just give you a few very brief points from, from the life of St. Athanasius and uh, and of Pope Liberius I'm going to talk about. Uh, St. Athanasius, he was born in the year 296, and then in the year 306, uh, Constantine, well, he was proclaimed as emperor, he didn't actually, he had to bump off a few other emperors before he could become emperor. He was actually proclaimed at York in Britain, uh, where his father had been at the time. I think, actually, when he was proclaimed as emperor, there were about six emperors at the time, and eventually he managed to whittle them all down to <laughs> just to himself. Uh, and as you know, the last one, he had this the, the vision of the cross in the sky saying, in this sign, conquer. And he supposed had his soldiers put the cross on their shields, and he did conquer. So he, dis- he did decide he would uh, you know, follow Christ. But just quite how sincere he was most of his life, or how much he really understood of the Christian religion, is open to doubt. He wasn't actually baptised. Un- until he was on the point of dying. But that was quite a common thing then. St. Augustus, you know, he wasn't baptised. He was well into his 30s. Because, uh, as you know, when you're baptised, it takes away not just uh, original sin, but all actual sins as well. So you used to think, you know, carry on sinning as long as you like. Then you get baptised and they all get washed away. But he was, when Constantine was baptised, he was actually baptised by an Arian. Uh, 
And we're going to see as well the dangers actually of having a state interfere in the church. Well, the great, the most important date of all is 325, of course, which was the Council of Nicaea, when they, this term, homusian, was defined, which means that our Lord was consubstantial with the Father. That means equal to the Father in every way. And this was uh, to totally condemn the, the, the heresy of Arius. Now, I'd like to read you a couple uh, comments on, on Arianism, one by Cardinal Newman. Uh, and this is what the Arians admitted. Newman says this, it's in his essay on the development of Christian doctrine, which I hope you've all read. If, if you haven't, you ought to get it. It's, it's a wonderful book. He wrote it, actually, while he was still an Anglican, and he wrote himself into the Catholic Church uh, by, by writing this book. Because, as you know, the pro- what Protestants say is that uh, the Catholic Church has added on to the Christian religion a lot of things that weren't there in the beginning. But what Newman did, he traced everything backwards. And he saw that you had a development of doctrine. He said, what you have to have is each stage in a development of doctrine has to be consistent with the stage that went before. And he found that when you examine any Catholic doctrine, say the doctrine of the real presence, each stage in that doctrine is totally compatible with the stage that went before until you go right back to the Last Supper. And our Lord said, this is my body, this is my blood. And Newman compared the the Protestant idea that the Catholic Church has changed or added to the faith. He said, it's rather like somebody looks at an oak tree and says, that oak tree can never have possibly been an acorn. Look at the acorn, look at the oak tree. They can't possibly be. But he said, if you'd watch the, uh, the acorn first sprouting from a pot, gradually developing, you could then see that the oak tree had come from the acorn. Now, uh, so this is what Newman said about the Arians. Arianism had admitted that our Lord was both the God of the evangelical covenant and the actual creator of the universe. So they said our Lord had created the universe. But even this was not enough, because it did not confess him to be the one everlasting, infinite, supreme being, but one who is made by the supreme. You see, the Arians taught that uh, our Lord was God's, the first creation of God. It was not enough for that heresy to proclaim him as having an ineffable origin before all worlds, not enough to place him high above all creatures as the type of all the works of God's hands, not enough to make him the king of all saints, the intercessor for man with God, the object of worship, the image of the Father, all these are titles given to our Lord by the Arians. Not enough because it was not all. And between all and anything short of all, there was an infinite interval. The highest of all creatures is levelled with the lowest in comparison with God himself. So if our Lord was created, then he was a creature. And as, as Newman said, if he was a creature, we could more easily compare him, say, with, a, with, with an ant, or a weed, or a fly, than to compare him with God. So the Arians would do absolutely everything except admit that our Lord was the eternal, uh, infinite God. And enough pressure was put upon Constantine for him to call the Council of Nicaea, which in a way was a worrying thing that an emperor should call a council. Uh, But anyway, at Nicaea, this term was uh, coined, homusion, consubstantial, our Lord was consubstantial with the Father. And that was very, very important, that word. That word became the touchstone of orthodoxy. You could use other words that seem to perfectly safeguard the Catholic teaching. But if you wouldn't use homusion, you immediately beca- became suspect. It's rather like today, you'll find there are a lot of uh, priests, sisters, teachers, bishops even, who never use the word transubstantiation. They'll find, they, they can give you explanations of the real presence that seem completely orthodox. But since the Council of Trent, when it used that term to define the Catholic teaching against Protestantism, anyone who refuses to use that term transubstantiation must immediately be suspect. Well, hardly, hardly had the Council of Nicaea finished than the Arians began a campaign to get Arius rehabilitated. And it was quite interesting... uh, as, a, as I said, you see uh, patterns of events repeating themselves. It's rather like, I believe in America now, your uh, charming wife of your president exercises some influence on him. 
She's a kind of co-president, a presidentess. Well, they got at the emperor through his sister. Constantine had a sister called Constantia. And uh, they used her to influence uh, the emperor. As I know, having been nagged by women all my life, uh, having worked in a school with an all-woman staff, and living at home, my wife and mother-in-law and daughter, in, in the end, uh, men ca- capitulate to nagging. And uh, so eventually, Constantine, who it probably didn't mean a great deal to him, I mean, he, he was very busy having wars, uh, killing off relations he wanted to get rid of, and all this stuff about Humusian and that, it, it probably didn't mean a great deal to him. But in order to get peace, he, he decided that uh, Arius had to be readmitted to communion with the church. Now, in the very year of Nicaea, that is when St. Athanasius, he became Bishop of Alexandria, which, as John has pointed out to you, was one of the very, very greatest seas or cities of the entire world. And he was ordered, Constantine sent out an order, ordering uh, Athanasius to admit uh, Arius back into communion. I've got the actual words he used somewhere here. It's quite uh, interesting. Oh, this is what Constantine wrote. You see, he rather thought, as a lot of the emperors did, in some ways the church was better off, actually, when the emperors were persecuting it than when they decided to protect it, because they would think of the church just as a department of the state. And that's, that's happened quite often throughout the history of the church. I mean, you have this phenomenon known as Cesaro-Papism, then you have Josephism in, in, in Austria, uh, where he, he even, the emperor Joseph, he even went about changing the liturgy. <laughs> Uh, he brought in actually a lot of the Vatican II ideas uh, at, at that time but this is what uh, Constantine said to Athanasius on being informed of my pleasure give free admission to all who are desirous of entering into communion with the church for if I learn of your standing in the way of any who are seeking it or interdicting them I will send at once those who shall depose you instead by my authority and banish you from your see. So, you see, the emperor thought he had the uh, authority to appoint or to depose bishops. Well, Athanasius, as you know, he, he stood up very, very heroically uh, to Constantine. And, and he, his whole life, he's going off to exile here, escaping from people there. One time, it's going to come later, the emperor Constantius, he actually sent soldiers into the church, actually, to try and kill him. And he managed to escape, but they killed a large number of members of the congregation. Now, in 337, it was a very, very interesting year, because in that year you had both a new emperor and a new pope. The new pope was St. Julius, and he was a really heroic defender of Nicaea and of St. Athanasius. When I said uh, you had a new emperor, that isn't strictly speaking accurate. You had three new emperors. Uh, It's an amazing with Constantine... uh, that he was silly enough to divide the empire up among his three sons, because he must have known that this was a formula for a disaster. And they managed to bump one of the sons off very quickly, and it ended up with two of them. One called Constans, who was the emperor of the West, and he was a Catholic. And Constantius, he was the emperor of the East, and he was an Arian. But Constans used his influence, even though Alexandra came under the jurisdiction of Constantius, Constans would use his influence to, to protect St. Athanasius. But, but of course, the two of them, uh, leaving you know, their religion and their orthodoxy aside, both wanted to get rid of the other one and become sole emperor. And it was in 350, Constantius managed to have Constans killed and he became emperor of the entire empire. And he was actually a committed Arian. Uh, and he immediately again began the persecution of St. Athanasius. Then in 352, you had the new popes, and Julius died, and Pope Liberius uh, was, was elected to the uh, Holy See. He began very, very well. He followed the policy of St. Julius. He stood up for Athanasius. He stood up for the Homusian. He'd make no concessions whatsoever. But Constantius, he, he, he just wasn't going to have this. So he decided to call a council. When, when you go through the hi- history, they have in councils called all the time. It's so confusing. Some of them were Arian councils. Some of them, in theory, were Catholic councils. They're having them all over the place. I'm only going to mention two today. So Constantius had this council at 353 in Arles. And he wanted the bishops to condemn Athanasius. And 
Liberius sent two legates to the council with the instructions to, to make it clear that Athanasius had to be upheld and supported. But uh, such pressure was put on them that the, practically the whole lot, including the two papal legates, capitulated and they condemned Athanasius, uh, which is one of the things you see over and over again in the church, which is bishops you know, b- behaving in a very cowardly fashion. St. John Fisher, as you might remember, he said of the uh, bishops in the reign of Henry VIII that he said the fort is betrayed even of them that should have defended it and he was the only bishop who stood up to Henry VIII so, you know, and of course he was ex- he was, had his head cut off for it but this was nothing new as you see during the time of the Arian heresy and other heresies bishops capitulated again and again and again I mean you can even we shouldn't be scandalised by this because you know, if you go back to the Gospel of St. Matthew and uh, you read about the passion and suffering of our Lord. You remember at the last, it's all in the same chapter, I think it's chapter 26, at the Last Supper our Lord said that one of those who supped with him would betray them. And you remember St. Peter leaps up and says, and though all the others may betray thee, I shall never do so. And then all the other apostles said likewise. And a few verses later, it <laughs> says you know, that, that they all turned round and fled. Uh, which I've heard that described as the first collegial decision of the Catholic bishops uh, in communion with the Pope. And then if you remember, the Pope, uh, he had a chance to redeem himself a few hours later, you remember, and uh, and instead of redeeming himself, he said, I know not the man. And it's been, some of the fathers have said, that could could have happened as a lesson to us, you know, really not to be shocked and not to be surprised if uh, people who are shepherds don't behave quite as we expect them to. But after the Council of Arles, uh, Pope Liberius, he stood firm, and he asked the emperor to call another council, which would be more representative of the church. And they called this, very interesting we're here, it was at Milan in 355. I could actually give this leave this talk and give you more interesting one on Milan from the air because my plane was held up something's <laughs> going on in Milan airport I must have gone round Milan overhead on uh, Thursday I think about 50 or 60 times <laughs> uh, but anyway that, that's what's I think so wonderful about having a you know, symposium like this in a place like this that uh, you were right in the midst of where all these things happened so they had the Council of Milan in 355 and uh, once again I'd be a sen- Liberia sent legates, uh, but it was a really, really exciting event. They had a, a mob broke in and threatened the bishops, and Constantius intimidated them directly. And uh, some of them protested, and they said, you, as bishops, we must be governed by canon law. And I suppose you all know his reply. He said, my will is canon law. And they all capitulated, but three, and, and the, the papal legates capitulated again. And Athanasius was condemned yet again. Well, Constantius had had enough now of Liberius, and Liberius refused to condemn Athanasius or to abandon the Hamusian, so the emperor had him exiled, exiled to Thrace. And they, they tried all sorts of, they tried to bribe him. When you read this, it's quite fascinating. They have lots of eunuchs involved. They used to send the papal eunuchs a great sum. They had a terrific influence in the court. Uh, with sums of money, but he refused. They, they were going to give him a large sum of gold to take, you know, to pay his expenses during his exile. He refused to take it from them. Then the empress sent him money. He refused to take that. So he, he was, went off to exile, where he was treated very, very badly. He wasn't actually physically tortured, but his conditions were made very uncomfortable. And he was subjected to what we'd call brainwashing today. They used to send Arian or semi-Arian bishops to him to... to try and nag him and wear down his resistance. And eventually, it's very, very sad to record that he eventually succumbed to all this pressure. And as the price for coming back to his see in Rome again, he subscribed both the excommunication of St. Athanasius and also he, there were three counts of a place called Sirmium. And they all put out very ambiguous formulae. One of them was this Homoisian, uh, which said that uh, the Son is like the Father. Now, you can interpret Homoisian in a perfectly orthodox manner. The Son is like the Father. But it's different from being one in substance with the Father. Substance, as you know, that's 
in Thomistic philo- philosophy, well, it comes from Aristotle, of course, the word substance is something that makes anything what it is. You could say, talk about a dog. Now you have, a dog has a substance, it's what makes it a dog. It's hard to define it, but you could probably describe it best as its dogginess. Is it that it has four legs? No, I mean, cats have four legs. A tail, cats have a tail. Uh, sharp teeth. What is it that makes a dog a dog and not a dog? And then what is it that makes a wolf a wolf and not a dog? What is it that makes a chair a chair? There's something about it and it has the substance. So it means in its being, its innermost reality, it's that and nothing else. And that's what, of course, we mean by transubstantiation. When the priest takes up the bread in mass and he says, this is my body, in its innermost reality, what had been bread before, if you'd been asked, what is this, you'd say bread. If you're then asked, after the words of consecration, what is this, you say, that is our Lord Jesus Christ. It's become Christ. It's not bread anymore. Its substance has changed. Though, as you know, the, we have the other word, the accidents, or, to all intents and purposes. It still appears to be bread. It feels like bread, tastes like bread. It has the texture of bread. But it isn't. Its substance has been changed. And our Lord had the substance of God, uncreated, existing from all eternity, uh, omnipotent. So consubstantial with the Father means that our Lord, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, and God the Father were both equal equal to each other. And of course the Holy Spirit as, as well. Like the Father, you can interpret like the Father as, as, as you could interpret his meaning exactly the same as, as consubstantial, one in substance with the Father. But also you could take it as being like the Father, but not identical, as it were, in every way. You see, you could say a candle is like the sun. They both give out heat, they both give out light. But to compare a candle with the sun, that's a very, very accurate comparison, compared with comparing a being that's created with a being who is uncreated. And the formula to which Liberius subscribed wasn't specifically heretical. There's nothing heretical in it. I was saying that our Lord is a light substance to the Father. That isn't heretical. But where his fault was, was in not using, was abandoning homusion. And that, you see, you became immediately suspect. The moment you wouldn't use homusion, your orthodoxy became suspect. And because lots of the bishops, they actually didn't, they were against Athanasius, but they were also against extreme Arians. You had these bishops called semi-Arians. And they thought both of them were making too much fuss. And that's where the expression came in about uh, uh, you're making a fuss about an iota, this Greek letter I that was put into Homusion. These bishops said, what is, how stupid to make a fuss about a little letter I. If it's in, if it's not in, what difference does it make? Uh, they said, yeah, there are lots... Uh, of things far, far more important to be decided. They're probably worrying about the inflation in the empire. I think that's what the American bishops are worried about, aren't they? And, and, uh, and perhaps a welfare programs in <laughs> Cappadocia, something like that. that. They have all these things to get on with. Fancy making a fuss and actually killing each other over a letter I. But you see, the, the, this is where Newman, this is Newman's great uh, point. He said his whole life was based on the dogmatic principle. And the dogmatic principle, Newman said, is there are things that are true and there are things that are false, and it matters. See, John and Bill would probably say the universities you teach, and a lot of people think they don't matter, do they? It doesn't matter. If some people want to believe it, fine. If other people don't want to believe it, that's fine. Why make a fuss about it? Let alone, heavens above, kill each other over it. As Newman said, it matters. If actually there isn't truth and there isn't falsehood, we might have, well, in a way, there's no point to living. We, 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 we you know, might as well eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow we die. The, the, the whole of life would be pointless. Life would be absolutely unbearable if you think of the consequences uh, of admitting this. So, it was a very, very grave fault on, on the part of Liberius uh, in, in, in making these concessions. You see, he could have justified himself. You see, apparently every bishop in the entire empire had agreed to excommunicate Athanasius, which literally meant, you know, not to admit him to communion. Most of the ones in the West agreed with Athanasius, but they didn't have the courage to stand up to the emperor. Uh, 
a lot of the ones in the East didn't agree with him. But the point is, you see, the Pope could say, well, I'm going along like with the collegial opinion of practically the entire hierarchy. Uh, and he, he could have found lots of ways of justifying it to himself. And again, he could have said over this iota, the Hamoisian, why tear the church to pieces at, the, uh, at a time like this? Why not, let's all accept this formula. After all, in itself, it isn't, it isn't actually heretical. Why not, why not accept this? and uh, you know, stop all the confusion and chaos in the church. So probably subjectively, he justified himself in doing both these things. Uh, now, there, there have been a lot of disputes as to, you know, as to whether he really did excommunicate Athanasius and whether he did uh, subscribe to this formula, which is the main thing I want to talk about today. But... Uh, Lots of eminent uh, you know, Catholic authorities, they've never had any hesitation in admitting that, that, that the fall of Liberius took place. And a very interesting source to look in is in Butler's Lives of the Saints. It, it surprises a lot of people when they find this out. And in Butler's Lives of the Saints, in the entry on St. Athanasius, if you look it up, it says this about Liberius during his exile. About this time, Liberius began to sink under the hardships of his exile and his resolution was shaken by the continual solicitations, uh, and then it names a whole list of people who made these solicitations, and it continues, he was so far softened by listening to flattery and suggestions to which he ought to have stopped his ears with horror, that he yielded to the snare laid for him, to the great scandal of the church. He subscribed to the condemnation of St. Athanasius, and a confession or creed which had been framed by the Arians at Sirmium, though their heresy was not expressed in it. And he wrote to the Arian bishops of the East that he had received the true Catholic faith which many bishops had approved at Sirmium. Oh. Uh, the fall of so great a prelate and so illustrious a confessor is a terrifying example of human weakness which no one can call to mind without trembling for himself. St. Peter fell by a presumptuous confidence in his own strength and resolution that we may learn that everyone stands only by humility. Now, what, what I want to uh, discuss now is this question of uh, you know, the historicity of, of the fall of Pope Liberius, because, as I've said, there has, there has been controversy over whether it actually took place. And uh, this little part of the talk, you know, I'd like to perhaps subtitle it, How Not to Defend the Faith. In conducting research, any historian of integrity, they'll be motivated by one concern only, and that is to discover the truth. In this respect, you can't have a Protestant, Catholic, or atheist view of history. The facts cited in the works of any author, they're either true or they're not true. It's in the interpretation given to those facts that the points of view of individual historians can differ, and there can be room for legitimate debate. For example, uh, in 1549, Thomas Cranmer, who was the apostate Archbishop of Canterbury, he published his first prayer book, which included a communion service based on the ordinary of the Sarah Missal, which was the missal used in Britain at, uh, at that time, and it was very, very similar to the Roman Missal, to the Missal we have today. Most people wouldn't would notice much difference. Uh, but what he did, he removed from the Sarah uh, order of mass virtually every prayer specifically affirming sacrifice or the real presence then in 1550 he did the same with the ordinal he took the rite of ordination from the what's called, was a book called the pontifical from which they had the ordination rite and he took virtually every prayer there uh, specifying that a priest was uh, ordained to offer sacrifice he removed that now that is indisputable and that can be checked from the primary source material. You have no problem at all. Anyone can go to England, visit universities, and see original copies. You can see copies of the Serum Missal. Look at the prayers in that. You can see original copies of Cranmer's prayer book, of Cranmer's ordinal, and see that all those prayers have been removed. Nobody disputes that. Those are the historical facts. But, although you cannot dispute historical facts, you can have Protestant and Catholic interpretations of them. And once you begin that, you leave the field of historical science for the field of theology. 
In his encyclical, Apostolicae Cure, in 1896, Pope Leo XIII ruled finally and irrevocably that Anglican orders are invalid. And one of the reasons he gave was the systematic expunging of all references to Eucharistic sacrifice from the Anglican prayer book and ordinal. And he said this rendered the latter incapable of, of conferring valid orders. So if a Catholic bishop used the Anglican ordinal and intended to ordain a priest, nothing would happen. Because using the uh, Anglican ordinal is totally pointless as it can't confer orders. It's what's called a defect of form. The form in it isn't a adequate. See, a lot of Anglicans, they, they keep saying that some of them have gone over to Holland and been reordained again using, you might have heard of the old Catholics, who, whose orders are valid and their order is valid. Well, if they go to an old Catholic and get ordained, they are proper priests then. But if they become bishops and come back and ordain some and using the Anglican ordinal, the people they ordain are still not priests because the Anglican ordinal just can't confer valid orders. That's why it's so sickening when you get something like this revolting man, Carey, who's now the Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, when he was, uh, had this Anglican consecration in Canterbury Cathedral, our own Cardinal, Cardinal Hume, went and wrote the, read the lesson at, his, uh, 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 at this uh, consecration. Then he no doubt gave him, him a brotherly embrace afterwards and congratulated him on becoming you know, the successor of St. Augustine. Whereas before the seminary, sorry, before the ceremony, Dr. Carey, he was a married Pro Protestant layman. After the ceremony, he was still a married Protestant layman. He was an he was dressed up as an archbishop. Uh, and it's scandalous that, uh, you know, the, the, the Hume should have gone to this place. But again, you see, that Hume would think anyone who complained about this was rather like, I mentioned you just now about people who made a fuss about the letter I, about the I.O.G. You know, what a silly thing to make a fuss of, you know, who, Kerry probably, he's, you know, he's concerned about unemployment and welfare, uh, lenient treatment of homosexuals, so he must be you know, a very, very pleasant man. What, what, there's a, a man actually, it's quite sad, he's, he's called A.N. Wilson. He wrote a wonderful biography of Hilaire Belloc. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It's, really, it's the best biography of Belloc I've ever had. But he, he's, he's actually become an atheist, but he's very, very witty. And this man, Kerry, who's a charismatic, he's been criticised for being a charismatic, and he said that intellectualism is a greater danger to the church than emotionalism. And A.L. Wilson said, not while Kiri's archbishop it isn't. But, uh, so I, I, I mustn't digress though. Uh, so as I was saying, so you see, there are the facts. The historical facts are that Cranmer purged the his communion service and his ordination service of all references to sacrifice. That can't be disputed. Pope Leo says that rendered his ordinal incapable of conferring valid orders, but the Anglicans deny that. You see, that's where you get a, you move from history to theology. So the, the Pope's interpretation of the significance of what Cranmer did, that was accepted by the Catholic Church, but rejected by the Protestant Church of England. But as I've, but as I've just said, there was no dispute about the historical facts. And Protestants, of course, they claim that the, the, all these references to sacrificing priests, they were abominations introduced into the ordination service by, by the corrupt Catholic Church. And they, they, of course, are returning to true biblical simplicity. Now, in some instances, historians of different persuasions, they've disagreed not simply concerning the interpretation of facts, but as to what the facts actually are. And not only Protestant, but Catholic historians haven't scrupled to distort the facts for polemical reasons, usually by suppressing or attempting to discredit any facts which didn't concur with their predetermined conclusions. And I think that while tampering with the truth is reprehensible on the part of anybody, it's, it's far more reprehensible on the part of Catholics, because we have the truth. The Catholic Church can never be harmed by the truth. For example... Uh, and when Galileo said the earth goes round the sun, the sun doesn't go round the earth, I mean, it's perfectly correct. I mean, the Galileo case has been distorted yeah, uh, uh, in, in a ridiculous way, you know, to attack the church. But you do no harm in saying when the Pope, the Pope probably generally thought the sun went round the earth. 
Well, you, good luck to him. I mean, it's not part of it. He, he didn't ever try and teach it as a dogma. And there's no harm in recognising that in that matter, Galileo was correct. And that the Pope was wrong. As you know, Copernicus taught the same thing as Galileo, but he didn't make a big deal out of it. And, you know, make it appear, what, where Galileo went wrong was saying that this, you know, proved that uh, the Bible was wrong, which he, should, he shouldn't have done that. If he hadn't done that, he would probably have been left alone. But uh, as I said, the church can never be harmed by the truth. So, if, for example, that we, we, we admit that Alexander VI was a grossly immoral pope, which he was, it's not part of the teaching of the church that the popes are, it was called impeccable. They're not inerrant and they're not impeccable. Uh, every word the Pope says isn't necessarily inspired. And uh, if, for example, you know, the Pope met some Italians and he says, uh, I think uh, Polish salami is a lot better than Italian salami, you, you would be prepared to say, no, we disagree with you, Your, Your Holiness. We think Italian salami is far, far better. In, in such a matter, he's not inerrant. But, unfortunately, there have been Catholic historians who thought that they were serving the Church by omitting or distorting historical facts which they felt did not present the church or churchmen in a favourable light. But in doing this, they could have hardly performed a worse disservice to the faith that they imagined that they were serving. Like their Protestant counterparts, they would begin with a predetermined conclusion and then seek out facts to, to, to enforce this conclusion. And they try to suppress or discredit any facts which went contrary to this predetermined conclusion. And in their defence, one can say, of course, that they are only responding in kind to the crudely anti-Catholic uh, propaganda emanating from Protestant writers, especially in the two centuries that followed the Reformation. Now, between the years 1559 and 1574, a group of Lutheran historians, known as the Centuriators of Magdeburg, published at Baal a history of the Church from its beginnings to the year 1400. It was known as the Historia Ecclesia Christi, the history of the Church of Christ. And their name Centuriators derives from the fact that this history was divided into centuries. Now in the breadth of its conception, it was a landmark in ecclesiastical history. But its authors, they were motivated primarily by polemical considerations. And it was absolutely replete with inaccuracies, including the deliberate distortion of original source material, which is the greatest of all crimes for uh, any serious historian. Now, an oratorian cardinal named uh, Cesare Baronius, who lived from 1538 to 1607, he wrote a 12-volume folio, folio history uh, exposing many of the er errors of the centuria Centuriators, and his book was called Annale, uh, Annales Ecclesiastici, and it was published between 1588 and 1607. And although Baronius did do his best to be accurate, his account of the early church did contain many errors. But subsequent Catholic historians would quote from this work as if it were a universally recognized prim primarily source material. Now, the fall of Pope Liberius, this provides an example in which the zeal of some Catholic historians to defend the Church was greater than their concern for truth. As I explained to you earlier, Pope Liberius subscribed to the excommunication of St. Athanasius and signed a Christological formula of dubious orthodoxy. This, claimed Protestants, proved that the Pope was not infallible. And uh, the case of Liberius was brought up a great deal at the time uh, of the First Vatican Council and, uh, during the, the definition of papal infallibility. And misguided Catholic historians, they decided to reply to Protestant attacks who used the case of Liberius to say that the Pope wasn't infallible by trying to prove that he hadn't uh, committed these faults when all they needed to have done was to say, well, so what? You know, that, I think you say in America that there was no big deal. Uh, and there would have been no problem at all. Now, I think, in my opinion, uh, I don't know, perhaps Father MacDonald has it in his summary. Do you have the Dictionnaire de Théologie Catholique? Yes. Yeah, yes. There, there's a French reference work called the D Dictionary of Catholic Theology, Dictionnaire de Théologie Catholique, which I think is, is probably the greatest Catholic work of reference that's ever been published. It, it was, they started publishing it in 1909, and the final volume wasn't written until 1950. And 
It's got a fascinating entry on Liberius, and even be, before beginning to deal with him, it points out this, and I'd like to quote from it now. The dictionary says, If it could be demonstrated with absolute certainty that, in order to bring an end to a painful exile, the unhappy Pope had abandoned communion with Athanasius, had established communion with those Eastern bishops who had been most guilty of compromising orthodoxy, and had even subscribed to the most compromising possible explanations of the faith, one would find oneself confronted by actions involving only Liberius and not the authority of the head of the church. There would have been no problem in placing Liberius within that series of popes who have not always shown a proper awareness of their duty and who have allowed themselves to fail culpably. So this is an interesting point to note, that during the history of the Church, we have had a whole series of popes who have not always shown a proper awareness of their duty, and have allowed themselves to fail culpably. Moral failings, or lapses from the right path in the intellectual sphere, have nothing to do with a pope speaking ex cathedra. One must indeed have a strange concept of this dogma to be troubled in one's faith by the adventures of Liberius. So, in its article on Liberius, the dictionary begins by pointing out whatever conclusion one comes to, if, if Liberius is 100% guilty, it has no effect whatsoever on, on our belief in the papacy and our belief in the divine origin of the Catholic Church, our belief in papal infallibility. Uh, even, it's interesting, you see, if you read the old Catholic encyclopedia, there's an entry on Liberius by a great English, a Benedictine scholar called Dom John Chapman. And he inclines to the view that, that this fall didn't take place. I'll say something uh, about that a little later. Uh, but he points out that even if he's wrong and the fall did take place, he, he more or less paraphrases the, the words I've just read you from the Dictionary of the, the Theology Catholique. He says this, It should be carefully noticed that the question of the fall of Liberius is one that has been and can be freely debated among Catholics. No one pretends that if Liberius signed the most Arian f formula in exile, he did so freely, so that no question of his infallibility is involved. If he really consorted with heretics, condemned Athanasius, or even denied the Son of God, it was a momentary human weakness which no more compromises the papacy than does that of St. Peter. Well, that was written in, I think, about 1906, the, the, the Old Catholic Encyclopedia was published. The Dictionnaire de Theology Catholique, this particular volume in which the entry on Liberius appears, that was uh, published in 1921. And as far as I've been able to find in my research since the Dictionnaire appeared, no serious Catholic scholar has ever denied the, that the fall of Liberius is a historical fact. If you look in, uh, there's that famous uh, Catholic Dictionary of, of Father Scannell. Uh, there are two of them, I can't think of the name of the uh, other author. If you see it in any garage sale, you want to grab it. It's called a Catholic Dictionary. No, no, I'm wrong. Addison Arnold. That's the one, Addison Arnold. Has anybody ever seen that one? Yeah, you, you've seen it as well. It's really excellent, and you, you quite often see it, and it's, it's almost sinful. You, know, you get, them for, get it for about a dollar of that, and it's absolutely priceless. In the new Catholic Encyclopedia that has come out, the entry on Liberius specifically affirms that uh, the fall took place. And there's a very fine English work of reference. So the editor was a Jesuit friend of mine, a father, Je Joseph Crean. And uh, he, he affirms the historicity of the, of the fall of Liberius there. Now, the, the question of uh, Liberius and Athanasius, it, it came up again, of course, at the time you know, of Archbishop Lefervo and his conflict with the, with, with the Vatican. Uh, he, Archbishop Lefebvre, never compared himself to Athanasius, but uh, some of his uh, supporters did. And so this whole question of the fall of Liberius came up again by people who uh, didn't approve of Archbishop Lefebvre. Now, as Bill was saying to us the other night, there are lots of things you know, Catholics can agree with and disagree with. And it's perfectly legitimate to totally disagree with everything you know, Archbishop Lefebvre did after the Second Vatican Council. But uh, because you disagree with Archbishop Lefebvre, <laughs> that doesn't mean that uh, Liberius didn't uh, subscribe to the excommunication of St. Athanasius. And, and uh, it's ridiculous to try and distort historical facts. It, 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 
to build up a case against someone you disagree with. But that, that is what has, has been happening. And uh, arguments that I, I would have imagined being discredited decades ago are now being brought up just to prevent any comparison being made between Athanasius and Archbishop Lefebvre in Liberia and, and the conciliar and post-conciliar popes. And these are the arguments people are bringing up. They say Pope Liberius never at any time sided with the Arians, under pressure or otherwise. He did not subscribe to the smallest article or word of the Arian creed. He did not excommunicate St. Athanasius. And he did not ordain priests to consecrate bishops outside the Pope's jurisdiction. This is taken from you know, an actual article. Well, that shows great ignorance, because the Pope didn't have jurisdiction uh, over all the great sees then. It was their own patriarchs and, and the bishops there who decided who was going to be a bishop. But St. Athanasius, he did go from, he went into the diocese of other bishops. Uh, John was talking to you earlier today about these wandering bishops uh, who were doing things they shouldn't have done. But St. Athanasius, I'll give a little quotation from Newman later on. When he saw the church in a great crisis, he concluded that a bishop is ordained for the whole church. And that if you've got a bishop who's corrupting the faith, that he was entitled to go into their diocese to uphold the faith and, and or, ordain priests who would uphold the faith. Now, these people who are now denying the fall of Liberius, they also claim that, uh, they say, all the allegations against Liberius fail to stand up under investigation. And they say because authoritative historians have testified that they are based on calumnies invented by the Arians to discredit the memory of Liberius. And here's a little quotation from, from one of these people. He says, to be convinced... One need only read a few pages of his eminence, Cardinal Hergenrother's History of the Church, and the brief, masterly rectification that appeared in Les Petites Bollandistes. I'll explain it here in a moment. In making use of this historical lie, that, that is that Liberius fell, in making use of this, this historical lie, which sprang from heresy and has always served heresy and schism, one would inscribe himself with the line of the Protestant reformers of the 16th century, the Gallicans of the 17th century, and the old Catholics of the last century. On the contrary, it is certain that Pope Liberius was an intrepid witness to the Catholic faith and that he protected and defended St. Athanasius. So these people, they just not content simply with distorting history. They want to abuse anybody who has a different point of view themselves. And I said even a, a defender of Liberius, like Dom Chapman in the Catholic Encyclopedia, he, he admitted that the fall could have taken place and would have had no significance. Now, the, conclu the confusion of those who are making these claims, it derives from a fundamental error in historical methodology. They believe that the credibility of a secondary source increases with its age. So they would say that a 17th century writer who's writing about the 4th century is far more likely to be correct than one from the 17th, 18th, 19th, and especially the 20th century. But the reverse is almost invariably the case, particularly where the early church is concerned. We know far more about the early church now than anybody did writing in, these, in, in the 17th century. As I explained to you earlier, Catholic historians, even in the early decades of this century, tended to subordinate historical accuracy to apologetics. Hergenrother, Cardinal Hergenrother, and the Bollandists are cited to justify this claim that the fall of Liberius did not take place. And, as I said, those who disagree with uh, these historians, they're, they're, they're supposed to be subscribing to an historical lie which sprang from heresy and always served heresy and schism. This is rather harsh judgment on the person I consider to be the greatest Catholic historian of the 19th century, which is Cardinal Newman. Because in his book, The Arians of the 4th Century, he had no doubt whatsoever that the fall of Liberius had taken place. And also, if you actually read Cardinal Hergenrother, you find that he, he didn't exclude it. He was rather like Don Chapman. And he said, yeah, it could have taken place, but if it did, it didn't affect the Pope's infallibility. Here's an actual quote from Cardinal Hergenrother. The fall of this Pope into Arianism is by no means certain, nay, subject to grave doubts. And if certain, not the result of full free will, for the fear of the Emperor Constantius was the motive, and still less in this fall was a definition of faith involved. Uh, then he says that some authors testify in favour of Liberius, and he says, but if all the accusations against Liberius are genuine, they would only show a semi-Arian Catholicising formula and not an Arian creed. 
Liberius can be accused not of what he did, but of what he omitted to do. I think that's something we could apply to other popes as well. Uh, what they omit, what they don't do. Uh, he can, from a moral point of view, be blamed for his silence, for his weakness, while the dogmatic purity of his faith remains intact. You see, most of the bishops during the reign of Henry VIII agreed totally with St. John Fisher, but they just didn't have the courage to say so and stand up to Henry VIII. They were like, as it were, the dogmatic purity of their faith remained intact, but they didn't have the courage to uphold it. Uh, in their favour, it must be said, when, you know, England became Catholic again under Queen Mary Tudor. And uh, then under Elizabeth, it became Protestant uh, again. And most of these bishops, they, they did remain faithful to the Catholic faith then. They'd come back. I suppose they thought it would be overdoing it if they uh, switched back again. And uh, most of the, probably the entire hierarchy, I think, with one exception, then went, went to prison. They all died in prison rather than uh, adopt Protestantism again. Now, I mentioned to you these people called the Balandists, of whom some of you may have heard. And this was the name given to the Jesuit editors of a work entitled Acta Sanctorum, which, which means the lives of the saints. And the word Balandist is derived from the name of the second editor, who is a Dutch Jesuit, a Flemish Jesuit, John Balandus, uh, who lived from 1596 to 1665. And he was the founder of the project, this project, The Lives of the Saints. Another Flemish Jesuit named Rosveder uh, had started the project. He died in 1629 without actually beginning the work. So that's why it's named after Belandus. This project involved a critical edition of the lives of the saints based upon authentic sources. And the archives of libraries and religious houses, they were combed for material, especially proper source material, and they built a special museum to house it, founded in Antwerp. If you go to Antwerp, it's well worth visiting. And the Balandis, they've been cited as proving irrefutably that uh, the fall of uh, Liberius didn't ever take place. Uh, now, within the limitations of the sources available to them, they, the, the Balandis historians, they raise the standard of historical uh, science to a level it had never previously reached. But subsequent scholarship... Uh, has made it necessary to revise some of their conclusions. And the Dictionnaire de Théologie Catholique has noted that the Balandists actually contradict themselves. When they began, they accepted the fall of Liberius. But then they decided uh, it was something that ought to be covered up. So they contradicted, and in subsequent editions of their book, they changed everything they'd written and said that the, the, the fall never took place. And they're very, very severely criticised in the Dictionnaire the theology catholic for the tactics they use this is what a quotation from the dictionnaire the tactic used by the blandists uh, is also the same as that used by some modern authors they show that the fragmenta historica are not worthy of any confidence i'll tell you what the fragmenta historica were in a moment they reject the authority of four letters that was four letters written by uh, liberius in which he admitted that he william boasted the fact that he'd excommunicated athanasius and signed the formula of sermon so they say that, that these were forgeries. Athanasius testified to the fall of Liberia, so they, they said this were, these are just interpolations. Uh, that St. Jerome, they can't say what St. Jerome said about Liberius as an interpolation, so they say he was influenced by falsehoods uh, being circulated, and he was deceived when he wrote it. And they claim, then, the, they claim the Balandis, and as I said, the Dictionary of Theology Catholic criticizes them very severely for this. They claim that he was not involved in any way with, with the signing the formula of Sermian either. Uh, so they, in doing this as well, the Dictionary says, they, they were conforming to a pattern that had emerged among Catholic historians during the 18th century. Where the fall of Liberius is concerned, the Dictionary explains, at first, the critics who addressed the question had no hesitation in recognising the fault of Liberius, while at the same time stressing that he was not, properly speaking, a heretic. And that, besides, his fault impugned him as a man and not as Pope. During the course of the 18th century, there can be discerned an increasingly evident tendency to exculpate Liberius more or less completely. Now, the primary sources that establish the historicity of the fall of Liberius, beyond any reasonable doubt, are they're, they're the testimonies of St. Athanasius and St. Jerome, and these four letters called the Fragmenta Historica, to which I've just referred. 
The Fragmenta Historica is a collection of documents edited by St. Hilary of Poitiers, whom John mentioned to you this morning. And they contain four letters written by Liberius, in which he states specifically that he subscribed to one of the formula of Sirmium, and that he had repudiated uh, Athanasius. And it goes into a very long and detailed examination, showing why all these letters are definitely authentic. And its verdict is the testimonies of St. Athanasius in Jerome to the fall of uh, Liberius. They're authentic, they're not interpolations, and they're undoubtedly genuine. And these letters are genuine as well. What the dictionary says, the authenticity of these letters of uh, Liberius has been established in a manner that leaves nothing to be desired. So far from casting doubt upon the dogma of papal infallibility, the sad case of Liberius can be seen as an excellent illustration of precisely what the dogma of infallibility does not oblige us to believe. It doesn't oblige us to believe that the Pope is inerrant or impeccable, or that all his prudential decisions are necessary in the best interest of the Church. This is a fact uh, to which Dietrich von Hildebrand uh, refers in his book The Devastated Vineyard which is, by the way, available, one of the most welcome events in the past few years is that von Hildebrand's books are coming back into print again. If you haven't got the Trojan horse in the City of God, uh, you can now order it from the Sophia Press. I'm sure Bill can give you the address here. If you order it within the next two months, I think you get $7 off the price. And The Devastated Vineyard, which is a devastating book, isn't it? Uh, that, that's now available for Roman, Roman Catholic books. And it, it's a, you all, it's, a completely different side of von Hildebrand in that book, isn't it? He almost... You would have thought, actually, Father Michelli had written it, wouldn't you? It's almost like a street fighter. He really laying into the modernists. He really pulls no punches in, in, in that book. If you read it, uh, you know, subjected it to the higher criticism, to guess the author, a lot of it, you wouldn't have guessed it was von Hildebrand, would you? I, 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 I don't think. But anyway, this is what von Hildebrand says about the Pope. No believing Catholic can doubt that the Church has an infallible magisterium, that everything promulgated ex cathedra by the Pope alone, or with a council, in matters of faith or morals, is de, de fide. Then we say, Roma locuta causa finita. Rome has spoken, the matter is closed. That's when the Church defines something ex cathedra. In cases of practical, as distinguished from theoretical authority, which refers, for instance, to the ordinances of the Pope, the protection of the Holy Spirit is not promised in the same way. Ordinances can be unfortunate, ill-conceived, and even disastrous, and there have been many such in the history of the Church. The infallibility of the Church is involved only in what are known as definitions. Uh, definition is teaching, very, very clear teaching, that's imposed as binding upon all Catholics. You have to believe this definition, or you cease to be a Catholic. You see, until the promulgation of the definition, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, you weren't bound to believe in the Immaculate Conception. It was an open question. It was virtually closed by the time the Pope settled it. But from that moment, any Catholic who denied the dogma of the Immaculate Conception ceased to be a Catholic. The same with the Assumption. Uh, so once a definition is imposed upon the Church by the Pope as binding, you have to accept it or cease to be a Catholic. But it has to be absolutely clear in the Code of Canon Law. It says, be, uh, in the Code of Canon Law, it says, because the consequences of a dogma are so serious, either you believe it or you cease to be a Catholic, it has to be clear that it is meant to be a binding definition. And you can almost always tell this by the way, the, the language that's used to, uh, in promulgating it. There are, incidentally, there are no... Uh, the definitions of the faith in the teaching of the Second Vatican Council. There's nothing in the teaching of the Second Vatican Council that, that, that has an infallible status except, I, I hope I'm going to make this clear, except where it repeats previous infallible teaching. In, say, the uh, dogmatic constitution Lumen Gentium, it states very clearly the teaching on people infallibility. But all it's doing there is repeating what was taught at the First Vatican Council. That teaching is infallible but it's not infallible because it appears in Lumen Gentium. It's infallible because it all was already infallible. And the Second Vatican Council uh, gave us no new infallible definition whatsoever. So, 
strictly speaking, any novelties in the teaching of, of Vatican II, they're not totally binding upon you, and if you didn't accept them, uh, you, you wouldn't be excluded from the church. Well, by no possible stretch of the imagination can anyone claim that Liberius attempted to impose a heretical definition on the church. He subscribed to it, but he didn't say everyone in the church have, has to accept the Homoistian. He, in weakness, he subscribed to it himself. And remember, in itself, it wasn't heretical. What was wrong, as I said, was avoiding the word homusion, which at that time was, was uh, considered tantamount to heresy. As I would say today, if someone refuses to use the word transubstantiation. There are a lot of seminaries, I think uh, perhaps Father MacDonald would agree with this, in most seminaries today, you would be uh, marked down or disciplined or failed, wouldn't you, if you use the word transubstantiation uh, Sadly, it doesn't appear anywhere in the Constitution on the Liturgy of the Second Vatican Council, uh, but, but uh, that, that's another matter. So Liberius, so I said, he did not attempt to impose a definition on the Church. I'll give you a little example of something similar in modern times. Now, Pope Paul VI, he referred to the Church of England as a sister church. Well, that is totally heretical. There, there's no such thing. That there's only one church. You don't have sister churches. Uh, there are a plurality of churches. The, the, each diocese constitutes what is called a church. You would talk of the Church of Antioch, the Church of Alexandria, the Church of Rome. That was the church under its bishop in that particular diocese. In the book of the Apocalypse, you refer to the angels of all the different churches. But there aren't two actual complete churches founded by our Lord. There's only one church. And so the Church of England isn't a sister church. The, Paul VI there was just talking from theological ignorance. Uh, I mean, some people say to me, some, do you think you know more about theology than the Pope? And I say some things I probably do. Because, you see, if you become a Pope, if you become a doctor of theology, uh, you get that by studying one, you study one particular subject for your thesis, spend years and years studying it, uh, and uh, you know a lot about that. You could very, quite well, know very little about anything else. And people these days, if they're made a bishop, well, today you're probably made a bishop because you're a heretic, but uh, that's another matter. But you used to be made a bishop, particularly in the United States, because you were a good administrator. And there's no particular reason why they should have known a great deal about theology. And even if you become a pope, when you become a pope, you don't suddenly get infused knowledge of every aspect of the faith. Paul VI didn't even have a seminary education. He, it's very strange that he was ever uh, elected as pope. But he had very, very poor health, and he was given permission to study at home. He didn't go to a seminary. And so, you see, I said say, to say that the Church of England is a sister church of the Catholic Church, that is heretical. But if you say that, it doesn't make you a heretic. I hope I'm not going to start confusing everybody now. In heresy, you have, you, there's a thing uh, you, you, called contumacy. Would you pronounce it like that in American? Okay. Yes. Uh, You've got to willfully know that what you're saying is wrong, and when it's brought to your attention, you've got to stick to it. Now, unfortunately, this quote to this thing of Paul VI saying the Church of England is a sister church, it's being repeated all the time. Uh, Hume's using it all the time. He was completely in error there. But he didn't ever attempt to impose upon the church to be a Catholic. You must believe that the Church of England is a sister church of the Catholic Church. That would have compromised the doctrine of papal infallibility. It was just ignorance on his part. Uh, Pope John II, 22nd, he didn't uh, believe in, in the particular judgment. He believed that when you died, everybody had to wait for the universal judgment. And he was attacked by the Franciscans in the faculty of, uh, of the University of Paris for this. And they, they made an indictment of him. It wasn't they weren't particularly concerned about orthodoxy. They didn't like Pope John the Twenty Second, So they wanted to embarrass him. So he had to set up a commission of theologians to investigate this. And he had to retract. He retracted. And uh, he agreed that he was wrong on this matter. But you see, again, he never attempted to oppose, impose that on the church as a dogma. So, to, to sum everything up, uh, the whole question of the fall of uh, Liberius and, and the he he heroism of St. Athanasius uh, can be summed up, actually, in the words of St. Athanasius himself. And this is what St. Athanasius actually wrote. Liberius, after he had been in banishment two years, gave way, and from fear of threatened death was induced to subscribe. Yet even this only shows their violent conduct and the hatred of Liberius against the heresy 
and his support of Athanasius so long as he was suffered a free choice. For, our, for that which men are forced by torture to do, contrary to their first judgment, ought not to be considered the willing deed of those who are in fear, but rather of their tormentors. They, however, attempted everything in support of their heresy, while the people in every church, uh, preserving the faith which they had learned, waited for the return of their teachers and cast from them and avoided, as they would a serpent, the anti-Christian heresy. I would have liked, I have gone on longer than I should, I would have liked to have gone on to explain what Athanasius said there, to the fact of the faith being preserved by the people, because Newman uh, wrote about this, uh, that during the Arian crisis, this was a strange thing, the bishops all abandoned the faith that they had taught to the people, but Athanasius and a couple other bishops, like St. Hilary of Poitiers, they, remained, they held on to it, but the ordinary people kept the faith that the bishops had taught them, even though the bishops were trying to persuade them to abandon it. And as Newman said, it's almost incredible that at this time, uh, the faith was preserved, not by the teaching church, the hierarchy, but it was preserved by what we call the listening church, by the people. The people refused to accept the novelties of the bishops and held fast to the faith that, that, that they had received. I might perhaps go into the, to that a bit more in the next talk. But if anyone, if you'd find it more interesting, instead of having a second talk, we could have, be a bit Vatican to it and have a dialogue, because uh, you know, it might be nice if you had a bit of comeback now, and, and anything that you know, I've said now, you'd, you'd like to make a comment on it, or, or bring up any points about how this affects you know, the situation that we're living in today, uh, you'd be very welcome to do so, and we might be able to have a very, very interesting discussion on it. But at the moment, I'll just stop there, and I think, I hope I've done enough to convince you that uh, the fall of Liberius actually did take place, and uh, St. Athanasius, as I said, upheld, he upheld the faith, he went from diocese to diocese, comforting the people, ordaining priests, uh, celebrating Mass, but that the fall of Liberius has no uh, effect whatsoever on the doctrine of the church's infallibility or its divine institution. In fact, I think it's a very, very useful uh, proof of the church's uh, divinity. Uh, have I got... Yeah, what, two, what, more what, yeah, two more minutes. Uh, two more Another interesting example of that in modern times is uh, of Paul VI and, the, and, the, and his in, in, encyclical uh, Humanae Vitae. Now, apparently, Hamish Fraser told me, he, he was told by some, some priests he knew in Rome, that Paul VI's entire inclination was to backtrack on the teaching and, and, and allow contraception. And you remember, he set up a commission to investigate this, of doctors, theologians from all over the world, and by an overwhelming majority, this commission said, yes, we can change the teaching. But when it came to the point of making his decision, he condemned contraception as intrinsically evil, as strongly as any of his predecessors had been done, had done. But of course, afterwards, and here's the interesting point, he did nothing to implement it. There was Cardinal O'Boyle in Washington, wasn't there? Disciplined priests uh, for going against the Pope's teaching, and Paul VI would do nothing to support him. So this is you see, how you see the divine and human elements in the papacy. The divine element is God will not allow a pope to teach falsehood. But God will not intervene. If a pope is humanly weak, as Paul VI was, or as Liberius was, and Paul VI allowed this teaching to be defied with impunity throughout the whole world and did nothing. But that's all that our Lord has promised us, that the pope won't impose false teaching on the church, as we see from St. Peter. The pope is not always going to be brave and courageous. And there you see the human element. So... You know, we can count ourselves very, very fortunate we, that we belong to a church, that we belong to a religion where we can have absolute certainty in, in, in matters of faith. See, if you go to an Episcopalian or a Methodist and say, suppose any Episcopalian disagrees with his bishop or, say, disagrees with Archbishop Carey, the so-called Archbishop of Canterbury, why should Archbishop Carey be right and the individual Anglican be wrong? There isn't any logical reason. They're, they're, when it comes down to it, Anglicans, Methodists, Baptists, their ministers, their theologians, they're just expressing their private interpretation of the Bible. But as Catholics, we're forged in having absolute certainty that on all the important questions of faith and morals, we actually know what the truth is. 
it which brings me back to the point I was making earlier, that there is truth and there is falsehood and that they do matter and we're very fortunate and we are able to know with certainty what they are. Well, thank you very much. We still have a minute on the tape and I want to record on the tape certain addresses because they're quite relevant. But Hildebrand's Trojan Horse in the City of God, which was his first book in a trilogy about the Vatican Council. He had Trojan Horse, then he had Celibacy and the Crisis of Faith, which is still out of print. Then he had Devastated Vineyard, which is in print. So if you want to get the, uh, the Trojan Horse, it's reprinted by Sophia Press, the SIP, Sophia Institute Press, Box 5284, Manchester, New Hampshire, 03108. The Devastated Vineyard is put out by Roman Catholic Books, which is the address of my radio show, and that's Box 255, Harrison, New York, 10528. I might also note that I have done something like 300 audio tapes that Keep the Faith publishes, and one of them absolutely relevant to Michael's talk is called When the Pope is Wrong. I note the perfect pope would be a genius, an educated man, a heroic person, so on and so on, and that every single deviation from the perfect pope is possible except one. Namely, that the Pope officially teaches as true what is in fact an error. That alone is promised us that the Holy Spirit will guide the church. Every other deviation is not only possible, it probably has happened. I think that's an extremely important thing because our little resistant movement is always smeared. They say, oh, you claim you're the Roman Forum, you're in favor of the Pope, and then you dare suggest that the liturgy is, is, is less good this time than the ancient Roman. How dare you say that something issuing from Rome is less than perfect? Well, we dare say it. And that's what is at issue in this entire thing. We have a break now.